Okay guys, welcome back to the channel. Unfortunately, I'm still really backed up on video content I'm releasing. As you probably noticed, I'm kind of schizophrenic. I'm releasing stuff from that Vegas install, the three mega systems, awesome behind the scenes footage that I hope you're enjoying in those um, excerpts. I still have much more to come on that. And we're actually going back to that guy's house very soon. He ordered RHEL 25s to complement his BMW Nautilus, Nautilus install. So I'll even have more footage coming soon on that to do. But I also have footage from my friend Doug. Those of you who've been longtime subscribers remember my friend Doug. We walked through his whole audition process, the MBLs that he bought. He also bought custom modified McCormick's that were made especially for him. And I went and visited him. I have some brief video of that. I also have an install up near Dallas. Uh, a renowned artist bought Rockport Cygnus, which are awesome speakers. But what was really cool is that he's an artist, but also a hardcore audiophile. And so he combined his room with an artistic flair and some things I've never seen done from an audiophile perspective too. Really meticulous attention to certain things. So you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to that. So if you haven't subscribed, please do so. I wanna thank you guys. Channel is really starting to grow now organically. I'm not really doing anything promoting it too much. So thank you guys for getting the word out. And I really appreciate that it's really been almost troll free. That's what I, many years, almost now regret not doing this channel earlier, but we would always share stuff among a group of audiophiles here and around the country that were friends and what i'm just trying to do is bring you guys in on that same level of behind the scenes and documenting for my own purposes these videos are as much for me documenting some fun things that i do as anything so hopefully you're enjoying that and if so subscribe give me likes or whatever that's really all i'm doing i'm not really monetizing anything i'm giving you like real music clips not any of this uh, royalty free stuff you know um and even though this video is going to be a review it's not the stereotypical forgive the pun uh, channel where, you know, we borrow gear, hit up distributors, borrow it, and they all review the same gear. That's, those guys are fine. I mean, I have no problem with them. I watch some of those videos too, but I didn't want to be another me too, those type. What I kind of do is if I'm giving you reviews or stuff like that, I'm showing people that give you the ultimate review because they're putting their money where their mouth is. It's no sending the stuff back. It's not like, all this hyperbole about how great it is, and then they box it up and send it back to the distributor. These are people that are actually buying the gear. And there's no, you know, sugarcoating or diplomatic ways of saying negative stuff like you see these YouTube reviewers often having to try to struggle with. You know, it's kind of funny and cringeworthy sometimes watching it. But these are people that actually put their money where their mouth is and buy stuff. And with a dealer like that I often feature, 3MA, they it's like no risk because if you don't like it, they'll take it back, you know, and you can buy something else, you know, and they've shipped MBLs across the country. Now I don't, don't vouch for you, anybody being able to just get MBLs sent to them to their home for a free audition, but I've seen them do it. And so they are more interested in you being ultimately happy. Uh, so no risk there. These people are actually putting their money where their mouth is. They've often done a lot of audition before buying it. And so I actually have a video that'll kind of help you guys determine at least what I use to determine what reviewers are good and which ones I don't trust um, and some checklist things to look out for. So stay tuned for that video because like I said, ultimately when people put their money where their mouth is and buy it, that speaks more than a bunch of hyperbole and fluffy jargon and language about uh, a product that they send back. So that makes me transition to something I own and I like to give reviews on stuff that I own and share that with you guys and a lot of people have been following the N Extreme build and the previous video talked about the build experience and all that part and if you haven't watched that make sure you do so because before you even hear me explain the virtues of this this still is not for everybody a lot of my friends I would never recommend them doing this they just don't have the time it's not in their wheelhouse to do this kind of thing. But if it is, you know, the early <laughs> indications I've spent a lot of time now with them uh, is that these are competitors to cost no object speakers. So what I'm gonna do is do a more thorough review, kind of what I would like to see other reviewers do in more detail and do it myself. And what I'm gonna do is kind of break this up into three parts. I'm gonna basically review this speaker based on everything else I've had in this room and benchmark it that way. Because when you're reviewing, especially speakers, 
it's not just the speaker. You can't isolate it in a vacuum and give a review without considering the room. I've gone to shows for 20 plus years. I'll hear the same speaker. That didn't change, but I hear it in a different room that sounds totally different and sometimes positively or negatively. So the room makes a big part. And quite frankly, I'm more impressed, spoiler alert, I'm more impressed by these speakers now than I even was at Danny's. And I was really impressed at Danny's. And there's a few reasons for that. And I'm going to go into maybe some of the tweaks I did to it, modifications, things I did, and how my preferences play in my room, detail all that stuff for you, and even give you measurements. That'll be like the second part of this series. I'll give you measurements at my listening position, each speaker, not just combined, at my listening position and show you why I actually have found preference even more so here with these speakers. And then I'll also benchmark, um, maybe I'll combine the parts anyway, but I'll benchmark the speaker, try to put it in a vacuum and say, how would it compare against cost no object speakers? Obviously I haven't had like YG 2.3s in my room or Alcivox $80,000 speakers, but I've heard all of those many times. So I'll try to give you a judge of where this would stand in comparison based on all those other factors that I outline um, for you. So without further ado, let's talk about the speaker in my room and my impressions. It's definitely the best speaker I've had in this room. This room was not really designed for optimal audiophile purposes. I kind of had to jimmy rig it and t load it with tons of room treatments as you've seen. And it may look schizophrenic and chaotic, but there's a method to the madness, as you'll see when I get to the measurements, that even though an open baffle speaker with different back wall distances, just due to the dimensions of the room, I'm getting mirroring performance uh, almost throughout the entire frequency range. So I'm gonna show you that, why a lot of this stuff is required. These speakers probably deserve a bigger room than what I'm in, but, let me tell you why I bought them in this for this room before I give you even my impressions. There are other models in Danny's line and probably more suited generically to this size room, but I didn't think they would give the performance that these have because I think one of the first things I'll give you a review on performance wise is the brilliance of this speaker is in its ability to give you that open baffle bass almost full range. It, in my room, it doesn't start uh, rolling off till around 30 hertz. And open baffle bass is something that I'm very fond of. Now, let me distinguish here. A lot of people are dogmatic. Open baffle bass is the best, and I've heard that many times. And I would agree there are certain advantages to open baffle bass. But there's a difference between open baffle bass and open baffle sub bass. When we start getting the sub frequencies, I'm gonna outline this as well for you later, why I still prefer a seal box rel to uh, Danny's open baffle, although that's a, fa a fabulous sub. I have nothing against it, especially for the money. But I'm gonna outline for you that part. But open baffle bass from Maggie's to any type of speaker that can give you that pitch definition, that naturalness, just the way it resonates in the room and um, propagates, is gives you a level of realism that is unmistakable, but you need a lot of drivers. And I just didn't think with the other models that I was gonna get that cost no object performance that I was looking for. Cause I had done all I could do with the cheaper speakers I've had in this room and trying, that was my goal, maximize whatever I could get, how close could I get to top level sound with inexpensive speakers in this room. I have wisdom, adrenalines, more cost, no object speakers in my other room. I wanted to just see how well I could do with budget gear. But then as I got the modified McCormick's, the REL 25, it became more of a goal here to see how much I can get to cost, no object performance, period. What could I put together that matches my taste and everything? And my taste became more so when I had this room over time, I used to be the type that liked a big room, sit back, see the sound stage from a distance. But for me, it required big speakers because when I listen to floor standing speakers that are typical height and I was farther back, I always felt like there was a, uh, a ceiling on the sound stage and it wasn't the ceiling in the room. You would almost only hear stuff from the bottom three fourths or two thirds or even less of the room. And you would, I would walk into rooms at shows and it would sound like I'm listening to midgets playing. 
So I never really embraced that distance, far field listening in big rooms, although it does sometimes allow you to have cool sound stage elements and depth and just psychologically from a visual perspective, it gives you that impression. But what I learned over the years in this room is that I really like even better near field listening of big speakers because what I was learning as I transitioned through the years and learned different things, I like headphone listening from the detail perspective. I hear things, you're right on axis with the drivers. So you hear things that are so pristine, clear. It's not driving very hard, the drivers. Um, and so it gives you so much detail and naturalness that's cool, but there's no sound stage. It's kind of up in your head in a nebulous fashion, and you don't get that visceral impact of floor standing speakers. So my whole goal was always like, what could I do to get every bit of detail from a headphone, but also get it in a room with the visceral impact and the sound stage. And so I found near field listening of really big speakers like this, where I'm right on axis and I'm not getting a lot of reflections that are big rooms that have big ceiling reflections and timing differences that kind of throw things off. I'm getting mostly on axis performance from the speakers in a short time frame, and but I'm still getting that sound stage. And so it gives you that immersive headphone type experience, but also a sound stage and of course the visceral impact from the speakers and subwoofers. So that's kind of like setting the stage for you what my preference are is yours may different yours may differ but these speakers will do both i mean these are being used in a small room right now generically generally speaking i'd say put them in a bigger room for most people but i'm just telling you they can work and one of the things even before i get to some more of my impressions i've had three or four people over already and i've gotten wows within the first 15 seconds I think a lot of people come in and think seven foot tall speakers in this small room. How how can you even get that to work, number one? And how can you get it to disappear? And that's where I think a lot of the wow comes in, as well as that open baffle bass I'm talking about. The ability to separate instruments, put them in a specific place, and the amount of detail you get, especially when you're near field listening, is what really is making people wow. And it made me wow, even with the broken driver, <laughs> it was kind of funny. It took a while for the song that I first played to get to a bass part where that woofer would excur the excursion would irritate the, uh, the the defect, and even with before that happened, I was like, "Wow, this is I've never heard that in this room." The ability to separate instruments and the detail I was picking up just within the first 15 seconds it was Im unmistakable. So I was impressed, and then that made it even more disappointing though when I heard the broken driver. But we're all good now. But that is one of the key takeaways you'll get immediately. Detail, pure bass, clean sound. It's got dynamics. Okay, let's face it. An open baffle with a bunch of six inch woofers, you know, it probably needs every bit of these eight of them. That, again, that piggybacks on why I said I bought this one instead of smaller ones. And even so, you could probably get more dynamic speakers. If you take some pro audio drivers, stick them in a big cabinet, ported bass in the back, you know, you could probably beat the speaker on dynamics for huge SBLs, but you'd lose a lot of that pitch definition, texture, that open baffle bass. So this is a great compromise. All of these drivers doing a little bit of work in an open baffle format is really one of the key takeaways because I have, most people say I have been the biggest hater on multi-driver speakers because Sometimes you just hear them shouting at you, especially when they're in a box and they don't integrate well. And that's why I took a trip up to Danny's to hear these before I even bought them, because this is counterintuitive to what I'd always thought that a bunch of drivers could be coherent. And but he does a great job. And that's part of the other brilliance is the crossover he designed and choosing these drivers. I may have my nitpicking with the, the driver manufacturer, and I'll talk about some issues I still have with that driver later. But. The great thing is he's found ones that mesh really well and his crossover works really well such that, you know, it's amazing performance, especially nothing to complain about at the money. We're not even talking anything near this price can compete with this. You know, I would have to talk about maybe a Maggie 20.7, you know, or even just to get near the ballpark of this. And then when you put this with, you know, his open baffle base sub or my rail 25, it's still game over. You know, you're going to have to get 
you know, way into a price range to compete with this on all levels. And, you know, different people will like different types of tweeters. I've always liked planers, uh, tweeter, tweeters, and I've liked B&G stuff, uh, Bolander and Grabner, and they're not in business anymore, but they did my wisdom audio adrenalines that are in the, that room. I always gravitated to them. The sound lines that I had in front of here, and of course, Maggie's uses planer drivers. And I actually preferred the 1.7s to the 3.6s with the ribbon tweeter, not because a ribbon tweeter is it better in some empirical form. You could say beryllium, plasma tweeters, uh, diamond tweeters. You know, you can put metrics together that say these tweeters are technically better in certain areas, but it's about integrating them. And can that tweeter play a range that makes it natural and fits in with the other drivers? Otherwise, you get these speakers where you're mainly hearing the tweeter. Yeah, it's fine. In the first 20 seconds, it's cool to hear something and a silky smooth um, stuff that maybe technically maybe better than one or the other material. But if they don't integrate well over a long course, you really don't feel like you're listening to music. You feel like you're listening to a hi-fi speaker all the time. And so what I like about the planers is that I think it covers a wide range that allows it to integrate with other drivers really well. So his pick for this may be questionable in an empirical sense of that's not the best tweeter material. Diamond should be this, plasma tweeter, all this, that ribbon. Trust me, he made the right choices here. It's very coherent and it disappears even in a small space near field listening. And you can pick out instruments in individual spots, depth, height, everything, and nobody's gonna complain about lack of detail with these speakers. So really, there's nothing I can complain about with these speakers for the money at all. Now, how was I able to even get more impressed with them here? And then what kind of tweaks did I did, do to kind of even elevate the performance in certain areas? And where did I find just a little bit of things that I didn't like as much that I tweaked? and improve things. And what would be some things, let's say that if I'm gonna do, where, where would this speaker go? I, I start thinking about what if Danny was to come out with the NX triple X, the Ron Jeremy version, <laughs> uh, extreme. What would be the next level of this if possible? So I'll do that in the next video. I'm gonna share with you my measurements because measurements at the room position are very important. And let's just talk about that for a second before I even do that video. Danny does a lot of measurements of speakers and he provides improvements to it in an, just an empirical sense for the actual speaker. And if you believe in that, like I do, and everybody should, you should believe in improving things with measurements at your listening position. It's, it's even more important, quite frankly. And that's one thing I am dogmatic about. You need to take measurements or at least have your ear trained so that you know where the problems are at your listening position. And you need to take measurements, unlike what Danny does, he does a quasi anechoic measurement, like one meter away or you know, just a few feet away from the driver, probably outside or some way where he's not getting interferences from the room. And that's what's required. And he'll do minor things, change ripples and problems. And so, and he's making a better speaker. But sometimes that modification ironically, may not even be better for you because if he took out a boost at a frequency where at your listening position, you have a dropout, when he gives you a better speaker, it's actually going to be worse for you at your listening position because you actually had a boost where you had a dropout at your listening position. So you need to do these things hand in hand. Yeah, you want to have the best possible speaker, but you need to get your room right first such that you can take advantage of the full performance of what Danny does you know, any great speaker maker does. Otherwise you're not getting the total value. So I'm very dogmatic about that. I'm gonna show you measurements of my speaker, how I'm able to do a lot of room treatments to get near mirror performance, even though an open baffle speaker with different uh, depths on the back wall, I'm still able to get mirror performance. I'm gonna show you that. A lot of things I do like this ASC2 trap right at the first reflection and also I'm kind of taking some of the back wall reflections out of the picture that cause problems um, you can't do. So again, many people will probably prefer the speaker in a bigger environment, but I'm gonna show you everything I do to make this work here and work really well. So stay tuned, subscribe, sign up for notifications and I'll see you back here soon.